All right, today I'm going to talk about some prokaryotic cell structures, but we really want to put them in context of the prokaryotic cell functions. So when I talk about cell functions, we talk about the things that all cells and all life needs for us to call it life. There's really just a couple of categories that this fits into. So one of these major categories is that living things need to reproduce. So reproduction is an absolutely key category of life and any cell that exists is gonna have structures for reproduction. Another very important category of life that goes along pretty strongly with reproduction, at least in terms of structures, is evolution. You need reproduction, you need evolution. So those are two of the main things that we need. Then we need to have something that helps us to get energy. And if you're gonna get energy, you typically take in something, transfer it in some form and spit out waste products. All of that tends to fall into the category of metabolism. So metabolism is gonna be important for all life, including prokaryotes. Then we have how our prokaryote or how our life interacts with the world around it. And that is the response to the environment. Now there's a number of key things that can be involved in responding to your environment. One of them is homeostasis. It helps keep your internal functions stable in some manner, but there are a few things that really relate more directly to the actual outside and structures that are needed to interact with the environment around you, not as much the internal parts, environments of the cell. In those cases, I'll be looking for things such as motility, the ability to either get around or get things to you. Protection. So how do you hold up against something that wants to injure you? And that also involves things in the environment such as temperature and other conditions. And then intake. How do you find the stuff that you want? And even a little bit more, where do you store it once you find it? So all of these are things that prokaryotes are going to need to think about. Finally, to accomplish a lot of these goals, especially things like metabolism, things like responding to the environment, prokaryotes are going to need a variety of enzymes and other proteins. So when we're thinking about the structures of these tiny little microbial cells, I want to think of them functionally in these categories because that is going to help me sort of think this through in a variety of ways. So first of all, let's start with the entire concept of prokaryote. So the pro part of prokaryote here, we often think of pro as meaning for, but in this case, it is more of a before. And so the idea of pro is it's prior to, and then the carry part of it is the part that we often think of as kernel, meaning nucleus. So a eukaryote has a true kernel or a small item inside the cell that could be seen by microscopy and a prokaryote has no nucleus and we think came before nucleus. So this includes bacteria, it includes archaea, it may include some other things that aren't really fully classified, but really it's mostly those two groups. And those two are similar in a lot of these ways, but also a little bit different. I'll point out a few of the differences as I go through some of this. All right, so now we're trying to think mostly of structures. So let's put a number of important structures into these different categories so that we can classify them and understand how they work. All right, so starting with reproduction and evolution. Reproduction and evolution work pretty well together because they both require a lot of the same components. I'm gonna essentially cluster them for this portion. First of all, prokaryotes still need DNA and they indeed still organize that DNA into a chromosome. 
Now, most prokaryotes only have one chromosome as compared to other eukaryotes that may have many, but they still have it. Now, that DNA and chromosome does not have a distinct compartment to live in due to the fact that these cells don't have a kernel or a nucleus, but it does collect in one portion of the cell, and in that portion it often stains differently, so we give that a name, and that is the nucleoid. Now, beyond just the chromosome of the cell, prokaryotes also have some extra pieces of chromosome and pieces of genetics hanging around. These are typically plasmids. Plasmids are small circular pieces of DNA containing one or more genes of importance. They're neat, and we'll talk about why a little bit later. One more important structure to think of when you think of reproduction and evolution, along with plasmids, is how plasmids can travel from one cell to another, and that is through a pilus. We often call that an F for fertility, or sex pilus, which is a little protrusion from a bacteria cell that goes to another bacteria cell. All right, so those are the main structures involved in reproduction and evolution. I'm going to jump down to the bottom here and deal with our enzymes and proteins because, like I said, they're key, they're really important. Now, in eukaryotic cells, you have basic ribosomes that make these, but then also an entire endoplasmic reticulum and endomembrane system to pick them up. In prokaryotes, you really only have the ribosomes, but you still need them and they're important. They're also a little bit different. So we give them a slightly different name based on the fact that they're structurally different. So we're gonna call them 70S ribosomes. This is compared to the eukaryotic 80S ribosomes. And if we were going to have a whole class on bacterial genetics and things like that, we might discuss the actual details of why we call it that, but you can just think of it as structurally different. The other key to it being structurally different is that if we're trying to kill bacteria and not humans, they have slightly different ribosomes. So that becomes important at later times. So now let's look into the response to the environment, because really a lot of structures related to cells have to do with how they relate to the environment. Bacteria really only have one major thing that ends up being related to motility. And bacteria are either modal or non-modal, depending on whether they have flagella. Now flagella is not on its own a unique prokaryotic cell structure because lots of eukaryotic cells also have flagella, but the structure of the prokaryotic one is unique and the way it functions is as well, so it's worth remembering it. In terms of intake and storage, prokaryotes are kind of interesting because since they don't have internal cell membranes, they can't pull things in inside a membrane. Eukaryotes often have vesicles to take something in. Prokaryotes can't have that, but they do like to grab and store stuff that they need. What they do with this is they add them to little structures called inclusions. An inclusion is essentially a area that is cordoned off by some protein. So not lipids like in eukaryotes, but proteins, and they can hide all kinds of stuff in there. So there are certain kinds of granules that hold materials, for example, bits of sulfur, bits of other metabolites that they need. Um, they contain a number of different items. So inclusions are pretty common and they're useful to hold on to things. All right. So then, the category of protection, now this one gets actually big and complicated because it is strongly related to prokaryotic cell survival. If you're going to be one tiny little cell, you better have a fair amount of protection if you're going to survive. So I'm going to take this one out over here a little bit. So first of all, the major immediate protection is that prokaryotes have a plasma membrane. Plasma membranes are important. They hold everything together. They keep the cytoplasm inside the cell. That's a key thing. Bacteria and archaea have slightly different plasma membranes. I'll mention that again in a moment. Then outside the plasma membrane, you have a cell wall. So both bacteria and archaea have cell walls. And then there's cell walls with different structures. We're going to get into the structures of cell walls again in a moment, but it's important to know that that's another protective layer outside the cell membrane. 
Then when you take even yet a further step outside there, you get to the outer stuff, which includes a number of different things. The glycocalyx is not in every type of cell, but many of them. And it is a sugary, that's the glyco part, type of coating that can be protective to a cell. Glycocalyx is there are three major kinds that would be of interest to us. There's capsules, which are very tight to one single bacterial cell. There's slime layers, which are a little bit looser and can then also pick up a community of bacterial cells. There's an S layer, which is often associated with archaea, and we don't know as much about the structure of, but is worth keeping sort of an eye on. That's your glycocalyx. A few other things that I would lump more into protection, even though they look like they should be involved in motility. Fimbriae, which are essentially little hairs around the outside of a bacteria. We think of them as similar to cilia in eukaryotic cells, but they don't actually have either the same structure or the same function as cilia. They're much more about grabbing hold of something and sticking to it than about moving anything. And so that's why I put them here. And then other pili, which again are little protrusions from the bacteria. In the case, typically a little bit longer than fimbria, but often not as long as flagella. And they are again for grabbing on to things and holding them. So they're much more in the protection structural side of bacteria than the motility side. So you can see they have a lot of things. Then finally, one more thing, one more important prokaryotic structure that I'm going to add to protection is that some of them form endospores. And so this is a protective extra layer that can be put around really just the DNA of a cell specifically to survive some kind of condition and then get to a place where it can grow again. So that's another additional bit of protection that we've got there. Okay, so now that we've thought about the basic structures and how they relate to the basic functions. Oh, we didn't talk about metabolism. And there's a reason for that. That's because in reality, prokaryotic cells not having membrane bound structures the way that eukaryotic cells do, don't actually have a lot of structure dedicated to metabolism. They do plenty of metabolism. A lot of it happens with just enzymes and some of it occurs in the cytoplasm. A lot of it does occur if you're going to associate any structure with metabolism. It would be the membrane because a lot of it happens in the plasma membrane. It's where all of the enzymes hang out. And also it's where it's able to grab the stuff it needs to do the process of metabolism and spit the waste product out immediately into the environment without having to worry about it hanging out inside the cell. So that is significantly different from eukaryotic cells. Okay. So now that we've considered a lot of these different structures, let's go one more step and think about how some of them might have related, not just in a structural way, but in a survival type of way. So a few of these are very particular to prokaryotes and very particular to prokaryote survival. So I'm gonna start with the one that is actually a little bit less particular to prokaryotes, but I said that it acts in a different way. So that's our flagella. So now the flagella is important for motility. And when we think of eukaryotes with flagella, often we think of them as swimming, maybe away from something. But with bacteria, the flagella are actually very strongly related, not to getting away from things, but going toward things. So the survival aspect of flagella is that they experience a concept we call taxis. Now, typically we put a term in front of that. So we might say chemotaxis or phototaxis. And what that means is we go towards whatever the thing we're talking about is, towards a specific chemical or towards light. And the way the flagella work is that the bacteria is able to sense the thing they want, point in the right direction, and then all the flagella essentially spin at once to push it in that way. If they only have one, they have one, but they often have many. It moves that way for a little while. 
Then it stops and reorients. So essentially turns in a little bit of a circle and tries to find the thing. Once it's pointing the right way, the flagella will start to spin and push it again. It's a little bit less like a tail and a little bit more like a spinning motor, which is kind of interesting. And that's how that works. We call that um, runs, where it's moving towards something, and tumbles, where it's spinning around, making sure it's going in the right direction. So that is an evolutionary advantage for a prokaryote that can't otherwise store too many things to go find what it's looking for and to be very precise about it. But speaking of storage, it does have that capability. It can't keep things in lipid-bound membranes of any kind, but it does have these inclusions. So it is an important evolutionary feature to be able to grab hold of something and keep it for a little while if you have enough of it so that you don't have to constantly go looking. So the idea of being able to store and provide access to things that might otherwise be scarce is a really important part of the survival. All right, so another one that I said I would get back to is our plasmids. And again, sort of related to our sex pilus. Because one of the key things here is that with only one chromosome, bacteria would be mostly reliant upon random mutation and then passing that on to offspring and survival. But plasmids, being an extra piece of DNA that can hold specific genes, actually add a new level to the evolutionary experience because now you can rapidly exchange genes. And the interesting part about the rapid exchange of genes is that you can do it amongst different bacteria, individuals of the same species, and in some cases of different species. Plasmids can travel between bacteria fairly rapidly and in all kinds of ways. It's very interesting. And so that allows for more rapid evolution in certain areas by moving these genes around. If you ever wondered about how antimicrobial resistance happens so quickly, plasmids are a big part of it. Okay, so another key area is in our protection. Endospores, although they are not in all cells, are a pretty important part of the survival of bacteria, which they are a part of, because they allow them to survive harsh conditions. And so in a situation where a cell would otherwise just die, the ones that can form endospores are able to protect their DNA and the basic things that they need hold on to it, get through a harsh condition that they wouldn't be able to live in, and then as soon as conditions are good, they can pop open, they can make new cells, and they can replicate again. So this is a very key evolutionary response. And then finally, another one of my favorites is the slime layer and glycocalyx in general. Put some of my notes sort of up and out of the way. And this allows the formation of biofilm. So I'm not going to get too into biofilms in this video, but essentially it allows a community of bacteria to stick to a surface and cover themselves with a protective sticky layer, therefore surviving in situations where maybe they otherwise wouldn't be able to and making themselves much hardier against the outside world. So all of these structures are important. Those structures have given prokaryotes an awful lot of useful things in life. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and consider just a few other things that are specifically related to some of these concepts. So I want to get back to the cell walls. So I had noted that in terms of cell wall, that it's an important part of the protection process. So first of all, let's think about where cell wall kind of fits into this whole thing. So if you have a prokaryotic cell, a bacteria. First of all, it's got a plasma membrane. And then around the outside of the plasma membrane, you have a cell wall. So perhaps that is the, maybe that a little thicker. The cell wall comes outside of that. And then to put this further into context, if you have something like a glycocalyx or a slime mold or a capsule, it actually even goes outside of that. So bacteria cells do a pretty good job of keeping themselves safe, protected, and out of the way of things that can kill them for sure. All right, but let's go back to 
the different types of cell walls. Three major types of cell walls to worry about. There are gram-negative ones, gram-positive ones, and although this is not the only extraneous type, I'm also going to add mycobacteria. Specifically in the family of mycobacteriaceae. Because they have something special that comes up. So first of all, all of these essentially have the same plasma membrane on the inside. So they've got a little bit of a plasma membrane. It's a lipid bilayer, just like your standard plasma membrane is going to be. They also all contain a substance called peptidoglycan. So peptidoglycan is a pretty important bacterial substance. It is a part of all of their cell walls in some way. It is a protein peptido, glycan carbohydrate complex. And in gram-negative cells, there's a layer of it, but it's not a whole lot. In gram-positive cells, there's not just a layer, but there are a number of layers layered on top of each other, making a very thick layer of peptidoglycan. And these are held together with other pieces, including things like tachoic acid. Mycobacterium actually start out being built like gram-positive bacteria. So they have multiple layers of the peptidoglycan around their outside edges. Now this comes into play with staining. And so when you stain these, they stain differently. Both the mycobacterium and the gram-positive bacteria will stain purple in a gram stain because of the peptidoglycan layer. They pick up crystal violet. The gram-negative end up staining red because they don't. Now, the gram-negatives seem like they're missing out here, but they actually have a little bit of extra protection as well. They have a second membrane. So they have an outer lipid bilayer, which is pretty important. This creates a space between the two called the periplasmic space that can be an important space for the cell to do varying kinds of metabolism. And for us, if we want to kill them, sometimes that's a spot we can target. And then many gram-negative bacteria also have some extra stuff sticking out the outside of their outer membrane. This stuff is lipopolysaccharide. So lipo for lipid, polysaccharide for multiple sugar. So they're long lipid sugar molecules that stick out the outside of gram-negative bacteria and act as antigens. So most of the time what that means is that when they infect a body, the body's immune system sees those and goes, wait a second, and throws all the stuff at it. And so... We'll have more talk about lipopolysaccharide in the future, but it's worth remembering that they attach to gram-negative bacteria. The gram-positive bacteria pretty much stay exactly the way that they are. They have that extra peptidoglycan layer and nothing else. The mycobacteria have one more extraneous thing, which is mycolic acid, which is sort of a waxy outer coating, allowing them to have an even better survival and protection against things that might hurt them. So that's three different kinds of cell walls and how they can help protect. All of these are a little different than archaea cell walls, which don't use peptidoglycan, but use a similar type of molecule. We call it pseudopeptidoglycan. But another neat thing about archaea that I want to point out just before I finish here is that archaea have a different cell membrane complex. So these lipid bilayers in the membrane, they involve phospholipids. And in these lipids, they connect in a very particular way to each other. And in bacteria, the connection involves carbon, oxygen, carbon, double bonded to an oxygen before it goes off to create a more long string of carbons. And this is an ester bond. If you don't remember, you might need to review some of your biochemistry. And this bond, because it has two oxygens fairly close to each other, actually is somewhat unstable. It's not terrible. Obviously, it holds together pretty well for cell membranes, but if you try to overheat or overfreeze it, it's not going to do well. On the other hand, and that's bacteria, archaea have a slightly different structure in which they're lacking the double bonded oxygen, and so they have an ether bond. And this ether bond is just a smidge stronger, just a smidge less likely to fall apart. And so this is why archaea are often found at very hot 
and in some cases, very cold temperatures on the extremes. All right, I hope that was interesting and useful in terms of thinking of prokaryotic cell structures, in terms of life, in terms of function, and in terms of things that help them to survive and continue their lineages.